Okay, story time. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the split and TSM. So I wanted to make this video to clear up some misconceptions and some concerns that I've seen on Reddit and on Twitter and on the social media sphere since TSM made their announcement that I wasn't going to be continuing with the org. So I know this is going to be hard for some of you guys to understand, maybe. I've heard other people say that like this impossible situation, but the answer is really neither. If we go all the way back to the TSM announcement when I was hired, you'll remember that there was a, it was a it was a three month trial contract, and then continuing through Worlds if we qualified. So I started my contract on, on June first, and the the story behind how I got there is is a lot of serendipity because. My wife is on maternity leave, who, by the way, is from Indiana. She's not European, for all of you guys who are confused about that. And I had just decided that I wanted to spend the summer season kind of in North America and working with Ember, who had given me the opportunity to like work from Finland and also from NA and also do my own thing and then work with Ember on the side. And then the Ember investor pulled out, and so that kind of fell apart. But I still had these, these plans that I was like, oh, well, I'm kind of like paring down my university job for the summer and my wife's on maternity leave, so maybe we can do something. And at the same time, TSM was losing their coaches. They didn't really like the coaches that they were working with in the spring split. They kind of had to move them out and put Parth back in to that role. And so, yeah, I had an opportunity to work with them uh, on the boot camps. And I asked them, do you guys want me for the summer? And they said, sure. Oh, they said, yes. So it was a lot of serendipity. And when we came together, there was no, there was no you know, conversation of the next year or anything like that. And so we had a meeting about it. And uh, I you know, took a spreadsheet and I was like, this is how much it costs to live in Santa Monica. Um, this is how much it costs to raise three kids in America. This is how much it costs to save for college for them, to save for retirement, to pay for our healthcare. This is like my wife quitting her career and becoming a stay-at-home mom, the opportunity cost behind that. Then we need two cars because I can't live close to the gaming house if next year, you know, if we want to save on rent. For three months it was fine, but not if it's a permanent thing. And it's just an absurd list of costs. Way more than you pay for like a 22-year-old coach out of, out of college. And Andy was like, oh, we don't have that kind of money. And I was like, I know you don't have that kind of money. That's the same thing I told CLG when I worked with them and we were thinking like, hey, maybe this can continue. And I was like, yeah, but not on like 50,000 a year, which is what you, you know, you pay like a coach in eSport right now, basically on average, if you take their month thing and you multiply it out. Um, that's not gonna happen in Santa Monica with five people to support. So we, we kind of knew going in that this was, a, this was a nice kind of conflux of circumstances that allowed me to take a massive pay cut from the month before and, and work with TSM for the summer and then see how far we could push it in the world's tournament. And we didn't know what would happen. Like both Andy and I were really optimistic, like maybe Riot would, you know, do something crazy with revenue, maybe they would unlock new revenue streams, maybe they would increase the compensation, maybe, you know, something else would happen in the scene, who knows? Um, maybe TSM would blow up and everybody would buy tons of jackets, whatever. So, so we left it kind of on the table, like continuing next year, but my passion, although it is in high performance coaching, is not, uh, sorry, is it, it is in youth development. It's not really in high performance coaching, although it's something I'm good at. It's something that, uh, that you know, I take great satisfaction in. Yeah, so I, I didn't quit because I didn't like it. I love TSM and I hope to work with them in the future. And they didn't fire me because they didn't like me. Um, so that's... Okay, so I've seen this a lot, especially in a lot of the articles. TSM hired me as a coach, and so essentially what happened was I kicked off the year coaching Fnatic and a number of other teams in boot camps. And I went in as a sports psych because for the past three years I've been working on transferring sports psychology to eSport. That is, taking the things that kind of work in sports psychology and figuring out how to adapt them into eSport. And I'd spent two or three years working on that. but. My core philosophy in sport, in sport itself, is that I don't think sports psychologists are useful or necessary. I think the most optimal setup is for the coach themselves to have the sports psychological knowledge needed for the situation and deploy it. 
So in a perfect world, every coach would have a master's degree in sports psychology. I went to get my master's degree in sports psychology not to become a sports psychology trainer, but to become a better coach. So when I went to eSport, I was like, well, I, I'm a swim coach. 20 years and you know, internationally successful athletes have proven that. I'm a soccer coach because my teams love me and they do well and, and I do really good youth development sport, youth sport, soccer coaching. I'm not a League of Legends coach, or so I thought. And then I went to all these teams and what I realized were, were two things. One, I've been playing MOBAs before a lot of these guys even had computers because I played Dota from the moment that it was birthed as like, you know, defense of the ancients in, in the Warcraft 3 mod. And two, that essentially strategy doesn't decay as you get older. Uh, you only get like more intelligent and smarter and, and kind of an understanding game strategy as you play decades and decades and decades of games. And the fact that I had a game philosophy and I had a performance philosophy and I had a game theory and that I knew how to like coach to that philosophy and like pull out of a team their core like metric of the game and understanding like how to break down a complex game like League of Legends into really core principles and push those meant that essentially what I saw when I did my trial through all of the boot camps with all these various teams was, how can I say this nicely? I saw a lot of evidence that I knew what I was doing and other people didn't. I saw a lot of evidence that was very uplifting to me about my ability to be a coach of the game and not a sports psychology trainer. So when I went into TSM, I kind of pushed Parth out of the way in the second week, not, not like in a mean way or anything, but I have a little bit more force of personality than he does and I knew what I wanted and I knew what I wanted to do and I knew what was right. I think there, there's, a, there's a famous book about learning called The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin and he talks about how you reduce the game down to its core tenants and build it back up from there. You start with like end game scenarios. And you, and you look at like what is important. I don't know if you guys remember, but there was this one game against Echo Fox where TSM traded their turret, their, their Nexus for Elder Drake. It was a very bad trade and it declared, it declared to the world like a misunderstanding of like the core principles of the game in terms of like the, the end game, like what is important and what isn't. And if you build off of that, and then you take the next step, and you build all the way into the complex early game, you can really get a, get a team where like all five people are smart and know what they're doing uh, in all phases of the game uh, towards like towards a, towards a clear cut philosophy of the game that fits the team. Of course, it has to fit the team and the playstyle of the team. So that's what I wanted to, de to deploy, and that's why I switched from doing sports psychology consulting to being a coach. I wanted to build something. I wanted to prove something to myself that I was, in fact, way smarter than all of these 22-year-old people who didn't seem to know what they were doing at all about the game and didn't seem to have a game theory and didn't seem to know what was a right move and what was a wrong move. It just seemed really arbitrary. It wasn't based on any philosophy. So that's what I was doing when I joined TSM and that's what I did in TSM. I actually never did much of the stuff that you would see a sports psychology consultant ever do. I deployed that through my coaching, which is exactly how it should be. It should be integrated in the coach. It should be a cohesive unit. Every coach in an ideal world would be a 40-year-old grandmaster of the game with 10 years of management experience and a master's degree in sports psychology, but that's not realistic. But it was realistic, kind of like slowly getting there uh, for one season at least for TSM. There was this moment when Soren said on social media or some interview, so anything but World's Final Four would be disappointment. And I was, I was really kind of dismayed by that. I mean, we talked about it, of course, but uh, the confidence with which the team went into Worlds did not line up with what I saw in how we were playing the game. The wonderful thing that happened at Worlds for me was we had competition again. So in North America, it really felt like the teams were playing against, like we could make mistakes and they could make mistakes and, and nothing would, like we would abuse their mistakes and, and we wouldn't abuse their mistakes and they would try to abuse our mistakes and we would outplay them, whatever. 
when we got into Worlds training, we had you know two, three smart people on the team, and the other team had five smart people. Like everybody knew the right move to make. So we, as a as a squad, needed to bring it up to the level of five smart people, just knowing what to do before anybody was told, um, because that's the kind of coordination you need to to win a tournament like the Worlds tournament. Um, and I didn't see that happen fast enough. And it, of course, it's all on my shoulders because I'm the coach, and I needed to make it happen. And I tried different methods and different strategies to make that happen, but I needed to start uh, 10 weeks ago during the regular season if I wanted to end up with the result of having five people who could all calibrate and process at the world's level and kind of pull in that mentality where everybody knows the right move and everybody does it. So I was not as confident as the day. Okay, I, th that's kind of mean because I actually tell the team every single weekend I expect them to lose. Um, so I, I try not to have any confidence in, in anything and, and only go by the results as they're happening and be accepting of reality as it, as it comes out. I think that the results from well, how we were training and the results from how we performed on stage looked about the same. So that was, was no surprise to me. I was hoping that you know, we could pull it out and bear down and grit it out you know, against these like, also very good teams who are basically at our level, but uh, we couldn't. Parts of God. I've worked with a lot of different pro teams, and the one thing that I saw with Parth that made me want to work with him specifically, yes, I want to work with TSM, kind of, but I'm a, I was a CLG fan before that, remember? But then when I worked with Parth, he had a systematic approach to the drafting process. And that is exactly the kind of approach that I think is necessary to build a consistent level of performance, regardless of what happens to the team strategy. The team strategy can morph, but if the meta, if the, if the pick and ban strategy, if the drafting strategy is very systematic, then, they, then the rules can adapt, then they will be proven false and then improved, and proven false and then improved and refined, which is, is really nice and I like it. In my opinion, if I'm gonna bet on somebody who's going to conquer a patch and become excellent at a specific meta, if the patch has never changed, I would say, like I would only ever bet on Parth. However, the, sty the style of adaptation that we kind of adapted as a unit and that, that I pushed the marketplace. So, oh, I'm guessing the rocks are the same thing. Awesome, okay, this is a second letter. It's oh, under. yeah. This just said it must be once registered in Germany. The system of adaptation we took, which was a marketplace system. So you see what's proven in the marketplace through competition, through capitalism, through uh, what wins and what loses. And then you take the data from that and you refine it and you process it and you pick a winner. That doesn't adapt very fast. So people like Reaper or um, people who draft on instinct plus system um, or people who take a lot of risk in their drafting, a lot more risk than we ever will, or ever did, I guess, maybe not will, because now we have to adapt to that. They are able to adapt faster. So if you look at the, if you look at the patches and, and TSM's performance, you'll see like a, a shift and then increase. So like adaptation is slow and then it's dominant, right? So when you figure out a composition and you train that composition, I was kind of confident that our training system like worked the best. And one of the flaws that we had was like the patch changed three times really rapidly over the world's era. And we didn't get to the point where our advantage in training environment would transfer into advantage on the stage in terms of like conquering the patch in a dominant way. Because the meta was still shifting out. So let me get into game theory a little bit here. I, there's basically two forms that League of Legends can take. One is that it's platonic, meaning that there's like, a, there's like an ideal form of the best composition that could ever exist in a meta, and everything else is substandard to that. So then your goal as a drafter is to try to achieve that composition or something close to it, and the other person's job is to try to disrupt that and take parts of it, or to build a counter comp and execute it better. But in a, in a, in a like pure vacuum, the superior comp will always have an advantage over the execution of that. If, if that's how the tree works out. Then there's another state legal ledges can be in, in some metas, where it's rock, paper, scissors, where there is a clear counter comp to a clear counter comp to a clear counter comp. And 
Um, that's like less common. It's actually more common that there's like an ideal set of champion interactions that, that exist and like those are kind of like fought over. And sometimes there are two clear distinct styles that like contradict each other and then there's a third one that arises, but that is very, very rare. It's only happened a couple times in, in league history. So we still hadn't like sifted through like what were the dominant players in, in all the roles at that point, which is when our training system or how we configured the training system of the team like strongly adapted and really got super precise at exactly how we choreographed the entire game from start to finish. So that was, of course, my fault because the state of the game is that we have this constantly evolving system. And we had kind of, kind of struggled with that twice already, so I had the evidence that we were going to struggle with it again. And unfortunately, the game changed, and so we struggled with it again. And that was, uh, I learned a lot in how I would build a system that can refine and also take risks, a lot more risks, you know, at the start of the, uh, at the, start of the uh, meta change, essentially so that that won't happen in the next time I get in the situation. I mean, you're gonna have to ask Andy about this, but what he said that he did was just take the budget from his coaching from the first split and threw it at me in the second split. That, that was it. So, as far as I know, there was almost no change in, in in terms of the amount of money he was spending on coaching, maybe a little bit more because my rent was a little bit more, but he still had to pay for rent for the other guys. So that was like recaptured in the budget as well. There's a lot of talk of, of like moving my family to North America. And I don't know what people are imagining when they think about that. If they think of like that I sold my house in Finland and he, that Andy paid $25,000 to ship all my furniture over to Santa Monica or something absurd like that, which would be the dumbest thing ever for Andy or me to do uh, on a three-month trial contract. So no, none of, nothing like he, I bought a plane ticket to California, only I bought three of them because there were three of us. That's what like moving the family to California is essentially. So there wasn't, there wasn't really a lot of overhead cost on that move because I just stuck all my stuff in storage. Okay guys, that's it for today. I hope that that answers some of the questions and concerns that have been put out there and make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel because I'm going to make a video essentially titled Who is Weldon Green? Because I noticed a lot of people are misinterpreting my motives and, and my career. A lot of people are asking like, what team are you going to? Who are you gonna work for? And things like that, kind of not understanding that my ambition has been and always will be youth development. So I have, I have a skill set of high performance coaching that doesn't mix necessarily with what I plan to pursue. And, and I do take jobs and work for other people. So when people say, who are you going to work for next? When people say, oh, he's going to trade in his brand for cash. I don't think you guys realize that I took a, you know, a massive pay cut to do TSM because my motives were not driven by money and nor will they ever be. So, so please keep an eye out tomorrow or the next day for that video. And in the meanwhile, on this channel, if you may have noticed, there is a 107 episodes of shows. Well, actually, I might not have uploaded episode 107 yet, but I recorded it earlier today of my advice show, Ask Weldon, where you can ask anything about performance in eSport. And I highly recommend you check it out because in my opinion, it's uh, essentially what I do to try to scale my coaching to the population underneath the pro level, which for me is where eSport is going to make an impact globally over the next 10 years in the generation of people who grow up with eSport as their primary mechanism of competition and personal development.